Well, we see each other again at the same method that we did last week. It's great to at least have some way of communicating and trying to stay with all kinds of information together, but most importantly, to maintain community among us. It's important for all of us to do that. So thank you for tuning in, and it's great to stay in touch this way as well. Obviously, we're going to battle a few more things, and hopefully it looks like it, there's all kinds of restrictions that are about to be removed, so let's pray that that would happen. And obviously, the first things that they're going to do is to deal with the inside people that are vaccinated and uh, probably remove the mask and probably will get together very, very soon. Probably the beginning, middle of, middle of June to the end of June is what they're predicting for indoor meetings. So that's hopeful as well. In 1885, a pair of distraught parents came to Louis Pasteur in tears. Their son had been bitten by a rabid dog, and they were desperate to find a way to save him from developing rabies. Louis was a scientist with an unquenchable curiosity and desire to help others. His studies in microbiology a field he practically invented, had helped doctors to understand the way the diseases spread. By 1885, Louis had been toying with the idea of vaccination for a while. But up to this point, he had only practiced his new ideas on animals. He hesitated to inject the poor boy with weak germs. Eventually, he decided he had to do whatever he could. He vaccinated the young boy and saved his life. The beginning of vaccinations. But the phrase that caught my eye was the unquenchable curiosity and desire to help others. So I thought, what the... What does that look like? What would that look like? Is there any examples that we can probably go to? Well, sure enough, in Luke chapter 4, it says that people brought to Jesus all who had various kinds of sickness, and laying his hands on each one, he healed them. He helped others. So that's one definition that we could find about the unquenchable curiosity and desire to help others. But I wonder, what would the unquenchable curiosity and desire to help others look like to us? What would that look like? Something to think about, something to really begin to practice. As God brings people into our lives, would we have that unquenchable curiosity and try to help them. Let me pray for us. Thank you, God, for the possibility that you are going to help us in getting together once again. And thank you for the great possibility that we all have of meeting each other once again. Thank you for the possibility also of meeting each other's needs. So we thank you for the strength that you give us, we thank you for the opportunities that you give us, and we pray that you would have, help us to have a keen eye to see people who are in need, and we too can have that possibility to help them. We pray that as we listen to the songs and as we even worship together with a, with a group, that we would be worshiping you and at the same time thinking how great you have been thus far with us. And as we listen to the sermon from Pastor Ed, may we be challenged to do exactly what he calls us to do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
turning back. The world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before me. No turning back, no turning back. Though none go with me, still I will follow. Though none go with me, still I will follow. Though none go with me, still I will follow. No turning back. Hello. Today, while we continue our series on the church's mission statements, I want to talk to you today about the area of salvation. Part of our mission statement says that Island Gospel Fellowship seeks to lead every person to salvation in Christ Jesus. Now, last week, if you recall, we looked at reaching out to the world, which is very much connected to this theme as well, except there we were looking at it from more of a, a global focusing on reaching out with the message of salvation to our neighbors, to our community. And so long as there are neighbors who don't know Jesus, then there is work to be done. Now I realize that when it comes to sharing Jesus and his message of salvation, uh, our co-workers, our family members, our neighbors, a lot of us feel inadequate we maybe feel intimidated. But the incredible truth that I would like to share with you today is that you are not called to do this by yourself. You're not supposed to do it alone. It's the Spirit of God who draws people to the Lord. It's God who does the saving work. Our role is to simply partner with what God is already doing in the lives of those around us. And to that end, Jesus is our example. And so today, as we highlight this principle of partnering with God, I want to uh, highlight a, a verse, especially from John chapter 5, verse 19. We're going to look at the larger context of the story, but this verse in particular gives us the principle. It goes like this. Jesus says, very truly, I tell you, the Son can do nothing by himself. He can do only what he sees his Father doing. Because whatever the Father does, the Son also does. <clears throat> Before unpacking this verse, let's just take a step back and look at the context, the larger context of where the verse occurs. It's a part of a miracle story. The purpose of John's gospel is to inspire faith among the readers by showing them that Jesus truly is the Son of God. And to do this, John records eight specific miracles that demonstrate Jesus' power and the fact that he is the divine Son of God. And six of the miracles that are recorded in the book of John, interestingly, are not recorded in any of the other Gospels. And so there's a lot of unique stories here. And one of those unique stories is found here in John chapter 5. It's the healing of the paralyzed man at the pool of Bethesda. Jesus has just returned to Jerusalem. He's coming there to celebrate one of the Jewish festivals, feasts. And while in Jerusalem, Jesus goes to this pool, the pool of Bethesda which reportedly had healing qualities to it. 
The story goes that uh, the angel of the Lord would stir up the waters of this pool and, and when the water stirred, the first person into that pool of water would be healed of whatever disease they had. And so Jesus goes to this pool and, and there he meets a man who has been crippled, unable to walk. He's been crippled for 38 years. Just think of that, 38 years. That's a long time. I get frustrated and sick for 38 hours. And I suspect that by this time, this man has long ago since let go of the hope that he would ever be healed. And he's even become a little bit bitter. And this is a unique miracle in another way as well. See, most of Jesus' miracles happen as a response to the faith of the person who is requesting the miracle. But in this instance, it's, it doesn't work that way. In this case, the cripple has no idea who Jesus is. He has no idea of the reputation of Jesus and how he has healed and delivered so many people. He has no clue of the opportunity that's standing there right in front of him. And so when Jesus asks this man, would you like to get well? The man doesn't respond with excitement and say, yes, yes, I'd love to. He simply says, I can't. It's impossible. He's given up all hope. From his perspective, life has been cruel and unfair. You see, whenever the waters are stirred and God extends mercy and healing to someone there by this pool. It seems like it's only given to those who are well enough to actually get into the pool in time. I have no one to help me get to the pool when the water is stirred, he says. While I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. This man has given up hoping for a miracle. It's just hopeless. But Jesus has mercy and says to the cripple, and I just, just picture him looking this man in the, eye, in the eyes and saying to him, get up, pick up your mat and walk. And in that very moment, muscles and ligaments that had been uh, weakened by years and years of inactivity are suddenly made whole and strong again. Whatever it was that caused the disease in the first place is healed. And this man gets up and he picks up his mat and he starts walking and he starts rejoicing. He, and he's so excited that he doesn't even bother to find out who this man was that just proclaimed healing over him. He's too busy celebrating. But in the story, there's a problem. The miracle described in John chapter 5 happens on a Sabbath day. Now, I'm sure Jesus healed people on days other than just the Sabbath, but it seems that many of the miracles recorded in the Gospels for us occur on the Sabbath. And of course, healing on the Sabbath meant that Jesus was breaking with the traditions and the rules and the interpretation of the religious leaders concerning the Sabbath. And so this leads to an exchange between Jesus and the religious teachers. By what authority do you do this, they say to him. On whose authority are you breaking our rules and our traditions? Jesus has just demonstrated the power, the glory of God. But the religious leaders only see the rules and the traditions that have been violated in their mind. They were offended by the unexpected work of God. And you know, when I read this story, I think to myself, I hope this is never true of me. I hope it's never true of any one of us. Sometimes it seems that when God does something unexpected, instead of rejoicing in the power of God, we're offended because it didn't happen in the way we expected it. And it seems to me that those in history who have been most effective in sharing the, the message of salvation to their neighbors and to the world around them have been people who have loved people 
more than they love the traditions and the rules of men. Effective evangelism will often mean stepping out of our comfort zone and often takes us into a world that is messy and broken. You know, for example, some of you may have heard of the missionary Hudson Taylor, the founder of China Inland Mission. Hudson Taylor is celebrated today as a pioneer missionary who uh, really uh, broke new ground in the whole area of foreign missions. But Taylor was not always appreciated by his colleagues because he challenged established traditions. In the 1800s, most missionaries lived within isolated missionary compounds. They lived within the safety of their walls within, among their own people, rather than among the people that they were reaching out with, to with the gospel. And, so, and he also, uh, instead of dressing like a proper Englishman, Hudson Taylor would wear the, the ch- dress, uh, the kind of wardrobe of a Chinese man. He even dyed his hair black and wore a pigtail so that he would blend in with a lot of the Chinese men that he was trying to reach out to. And as a result, he was criticized by his colleagues. He was even rejected by the missionary society that had sent him to China in the first place. But he be- ended up becoming effective in bringing the gospel message to, chi- to the Chinese people because he loved people more than he loved the traditions of men. More recently, I uh, I heard a story of a a church in our EMC conference that uh, one lay minister described his church as becoming messy and beautiful at the same time. Apparently, there's a couple of young men from their congregation who got involved in in a youth teen drop-in center that deals with youth who are at risk, and a lot of these youth are, are kind of rough around the edges, but, but they went there and they loved these youth and they started inviting them to their church. Well, because they felt loved, they also started, these teens started inviting their friends as well. And over the last few years, this lay leader reported, there have been more than 200 unchurched youth that have come through the doors of their church on a Sunday morning. Isn't that amazing? He says they sit in the back and are a bit noisy, but it's a good noise. And when you walk into our church or out of our church, you may have to pass through a group of teens out in the parking lot who are having a smoke break. They welcome them. I don't know how some of the, uh, how the, everyone in the congregation felt about this. I'm sure that there were some ruffled feathers in the midst of all of this. But on the whole, they welcomed them, not only into the church building, but they welcomed them even to their families, into their homes. They loved these young people more than they loved the tradition of men. You know, I don't know what opportunities for outreach God may open up for us. God opens up different opportunities for different congregations. It might be in the opportunity to reach out to families or seniors or to the addicted, the broken. But whatever it is, the point is that effective evangelism often takes us out of our comfort zone. Well, anyways, that's a little bit of a rabbit trail, but I just seeing the religious leader's response to Jesus just reminded me how easy it is to be offended by the, when God does an unexpected work. Getting back to the story now, Jesus responds to the concerns that these religious leaders have about the Sabbath, and he says this, My father is always at work to this very day. And I, too, am working. Very truly, I tell you, the son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees his father doing. Because whatever the father does, the son also does. Jesus recognizes that the father sets the agenda. He sets the direction for ministry. And Jesus depends on that. And if Jesus, who is the very son of God, who in bodies 
the Godhead in every aspect, if he depends on the Father for direction for his ministry, then how much more do we need to depend on God for direction and guidance for our ministries? I've often thought about how Jesus, you know, he only had three years of ministry in this world. Three years, that's not a lot of time. And yet, by, just before his death, Jesus was able to say, I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. This is a prayer that uh, John is, or sorry, Jesus is praying to his father in John chapter 17. I have finished, completed the work you gave me to do. And you know, it's easy to say, well, Jesus, how could you say that? There was still so much left to do. Yes, Jesus healed the sick, but there were others who remained diseased and uh, who had leprosy or blind or lame. Yes, he set captives free, but there were still others living under demonic oppression and spiritual bondage. Yes, Jesus fed the multitudes, but how many more were still going hungry to bed every night? How could Jesus say that he had completed the work? Well, it's because Jesus didn't come to do everything. He came to do the work that his Father gave him to do. And when Jesus sees his Father at work in the life of a cripple by this pool of Bethesda, he responds by joining his Father in this work. The Father opens up an opportunity and Jesus responds in obedience. Whatever the Father does, the Son does also. Jesus, in this Jesus, is our pattern. So the question then is, how do we follow the example of Jesus? How do we join God in the work that the Lord is already doing in the people around us? You know, in a perfect world, I suppose we would be so in tune with God that we would just instinctively know what God is already doing in the world. But we're not perfect. But here's a few principles that we see in the life of Jesus that helped him be in tune with his Father. First of all, Jesus acknowledged his dependence on the Father, and we need to acknowledge our dependence on God as well. It's significant that Jesus said as he walked this earth that the Son can do nothing by himself. That's an astounding statement. The Son can do nothing by himself. As much as you know, there are a lot of good training tools and evangelism tools that we can uh, latch on to and help us in our desire to, to reach out with the gospel, the reality is at the end of the day, spiritual fruit only comes as the Father works through us. It's not our doing. We don't save anyone. Only God does that. And I think that this truth is both humble and it's also very encouraging for us as well. It's humbling in the sense that whenever we do have some success, we can't say that we did it. It's simply the grace of God working through us. In fact, we know from Scripture that God prefers to work through the weak, the foolish, so that he can confound the wise and the powerful. God doesn't need our strength or our talents, our abilities. What he's really looking for is our dependence on the Lord. And this should be encouraging to us because that means that God can really work through anyone, anyone who depends on him. It's not that evangelism training is, not, is bad or these tools aren't good, but we always have to remember that techniques and strategies don't save people from sin. It's God who does that. God working through his people. In John chapter 15, Jesus said, I am the vine and you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Apart from me, you can do nothing. And so remember our dependence. And as we do that, we will be more inclined to say, God, show me what you're doing because I can't do it myself. 
Show me what you're doing and I will be available in any way that you want. Secondly, we need to pursue intimacy with the Father, just as Jesus did. You know, sharing the gospel isn't about technique, it's really about having a relationship with our Father in heaven. And we see this uh, so often in the way that Jesus talked about his Father in heaven. He referred to the Lord as my Father. There's a closeness and an intimacy that Jesus expressed in his relationship with God that you simply didn't see with the religious teachers of his day. The Jews would never have called God their father. But Jesus' earthly ministry, in his ministry, he demonstrates a closeness with God that was remarkable and unusual. In John chapter 5, verse 20, Jesus says, For the Father loves the Son and shows him all he does. The Father loves the Son and shows him all he does. You can hear the intimacy in the way Jesus walks in the presence of God. And Jesus encourages us as his followers to have that kind of intimacy with the Lord as well. I think of that verse in Romans chapter 8, verse 15, where Paul says that you have not received a spirit that makes you sleep, fearful slaves. Instead, you have received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Abba, Father. That term, Abba, is, a, is an Aramaic term that's just, it's a term of intimacy. It's a, a word that a child would use when they talk to their father. Abba, Father. Having a close relationship with God allows us to see the world around us through the lens of our Father. Instead of disdain, we see the brokenness and the sinfulness of others with compassion because we see it through his eyes. Instead of traditions and rules that often lead to a judgmental attitude, we will see a God who desires to bring healing and give the gift of eternal life to those around us. Having intimacy with God allows us to value and love those around us, to love the world like he loves the world. And so we need to pursue intimacy with God so that he can direct our lives. And then thirdly, look for the hand of God in, in all things, in the unexpected. When we acknowledge the dependence, our dependence on God, when we pursue intimacy with him, then we can expect to see opportunities in unlooked for and unexpected ways. I always find it interesting how much of Jesus's ministry happens almost accidentally. It happens in the midst of interruptions to Jesus's day. In Luke chapter eight, for instance, he's, Jesus is teaching a crowd of people and, and they're listening to him. And a man approaches Jesus and says, my daughter is sick, will you come with me to heal her? And Jesus just leaves the crowd and he follows this man to his home. And while he's on the way to Jairus' home, there's another woman who approaches Jesus and just touches the tassel on his garment, the edge of his garment, because she has been bleeding. Uh, she's experienced bleeding for 12 years, it says. And as she touches his garment, she's healed. And, and it, this just seems so typical of the way Jesus' day goes. Ministry opportunities just come about in the interruptions of his day. Jesus always had his eyes open, even during unexpected and the inconvenient, to see what the Father was doing. It seems to me that I'm too often, uh, when, when I'm interrupted, when, when things happen that I didn't expect, or things that are inconvenient happen, instead of asking, Lord, what are you up to in this? I just feel kind of resentful. You know, I think for a lot of us, we feel interrupted and dis disrupted by this whole pandemic, and we're, we're just done with it, and we want to move on. But maybe we need to say, Lord, what, 
are you doing in the midst of this? And how can I work together with you? Maybe when you experience illness or go through a journey of grief, instead of feeling like this is a disruption to my life, maybe we need to say, Lord, is there somebody who's suffering right now that you want to use me to speak to because I've gone through something like this? And God doesn't just work through the hard things. He also works through the blessings as well. Right now as a church, uh, we're going through a bit of an exciting transition here. Uh, a little bit of a baby boom. I was counting the other day, and I'm not sure if I've shared this with you. I know I've mentioned it to different people. But uh, right now, after this summer, I count that there would be about 20 children age 5 and under. You know, that's not bad for a, a congregation that's only about 100 people. I, I think it's fantastic. And I believe that God is opening up a door of ministry, not only to the families in our church, but in, to other young families in our community through this. We need to see this as an opportunity to partner with God. Henry Blackenby, in his book, Experiencing God, tells of a time when he was pastoring a church in Saskatoon that, that this church felt that they should be beginning, starting up a, a ministry in this, among the students at the local university. And, though, and they thought that, that they would do this by starting up some Bible study groups on campus. And for two years, they tried starting up these study groups and didn't have any success. And then one day, Blackenby told some students who were attending their church, I guess he had been reading, as I understand it, he had been reading this verse where Jesus says that he only does what the Father does. And so he encouraged students who attended their church, pay attention to the way that God is at work on your campus. And if you find someone who is asking spiritual questions, whatever else you have planned, just drop it. Go with that person. Find out what God is doing. Later that week, a student reported that she had met a girl that she had known for a couple of years already. And this girl had just asked you know, if she was a Christian. Well, she said yes. And she obviously had some questions, so she didn't go to her class. She went with this girl, and it turns out that there were some students on campus who were reading the Bible for themselves, but they had all kinds of questions that, that they couldn't answer. <clears throat> and so from this discussion, this contact, three different Bible study groups began on the campus, and many students came to be followers of Jesus Christ. Now, from my experience, God's work is often very subtle and perhaps less dramatic than this example that Henry Blackenby shares. Maybe it's simply an opportunity to help a neighbor. And this is an open door. This is a way of participating in the work that God is doing in the life of your neighbor. Maybe it's to listen to a friend, to say a prayer with someone who feels alone. Sometimes, a divine interruption happens in our life and maybe we're forced to go to the hospital or our car breaks down in something that's, that we didn't appreciate at the moment, but God wants to use it because he's at work in amongst the people around you. The point is that we need to keep our eyes open to the unexpected ways that God is at work around us. And as we think about bringing the good news of salvation and the hope to this community, let me challenge you to consciously look for what God is doing amongst your friends, amongst your co-workers and your neighbors. And be prepared to partner with what God is doing. Be like Isaiah who says, here I am, send me, Lord. Recognize just as Jesus recognized his dependence on the Father, you and I need to recognize our dependence on God. This is not something that we can do by ourselves. We need to be available to God. And just as Jesus fostered intimacy with the Lord, we need to take time with the Lord through prayer and through the scripture reading. 
And just as Jesus was ready to respond to the unexpected and often surprising work that the Father was doing, we need to be ready to drop what we're doing and partner with God. Island Gospel Fellowship exists to lead every person to salvation and maturity in Christ Jesus. That's our heart's desire. And it's a huge task, but God wants you to participate in it. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that you have committed to us the message of reconciliation. You have given us the opportunity to work in partnership with your spirit, in partnership with the power of the Lord, so that we can share the good news of salvation with those around us. Lord, give us courage when we need courage. Give us sensitivity when we uh, are tempted to be judgmental. Give us love and compassion for those who are in need. Lord, help us to see the world around us through your eyes. I thank you for each one of this congregation, and we just pray, Lord, that you would bless each one, that you would um, help us not to be content in just creating our own little community, but to desire to share the good news and the eternal life that you've given to us with others. And Lord, as we go throughout our week, open our eyes. Bless us, we pray, that we might be a blessing to those around us. For we pray this in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, Amen. Have a good week. We'll see you again next time.